Joe, and um, thank you all for coming out. It is such a treat to be here with you in person, uh, and such a delight to be staying at Quarry Farm and being part of this tradition, as Joe said, of community engagement of social justice that dates back to uh, Twain's time there when Jervis Langdon was um, participating in the Underground Railroad and a lot of these ideas were swirling around. Um, I'm really just, it's really special to me to be able to speak here and, and share some of the things I've been working on. Um, the thing that's uh, kind of funny is what I've actually been working on up there on the hill in the cool air has actually been more about uh, the representation of Native Americans in Twain. But what I'm going to be talking about today is the piece that Joe mentioned that was published in J19, uh, which is all about Twain, Ernest Hemingway, and modern American literature. Um, so it's a much more literary talk. It's going to get like nitty gritty into the language. So before I dive straight in, can I do like a poll the audience? Um, who remembers Huckleberry Finn? Like maybe you had to read it in high school. Okay, so like how would you describe Huck's language? Like how does it how does it come across on the page? Well, stick with your think about it when you see it on the page, let's mm -hmm. say it. Mm-hmm. You have to kind of say it out loud. It makes you want to say it out loud. It's kind of rustic. It's like natural. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, refresh our memory real quick, in case you want a sample of it. Well, I got a good going over in the morning from old Miss Watson on account of my clothes. But the widow, she didn't scold, but only cleaned off the grease and clay, and looked so sorry that I thought I would behave a while if I could. Then Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed. But nothing came of it. She told me to pray every day. And whatever I asked for, I would get it. But it weren't so. I tried it. Once I got a fish line, but no hooks. It weren't any good to me without hooks. I tried for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by, one day, I asked Miss Watson to try for me. But she said I was a fool. She never told me why, and I couldn't make it out no way. I thought that was a good passage to read in church. Um, and then the other piece of this puzzle is Ernest Hemingway. Uh, what about For Whom the Bell Tolls? Was that on your high school reading list way back in the past? Okay, a fair amount of people. Um, sound the same? Sound different? Different. Pretty different, yeah. A um, little sample of that is um, Keep thy mouth off what we must do when thy business is finished. It is thy business. I do not put my hand in it. But you did. Take thy little cropped headed woman and go back to the Republic. But do not shut the door on others who loved the Republic when thou wert wiping thy mother's milk off thy chin. <laughs> okay, so that is the setup to this. Uh, we have Twain, very natural, rustic, speaking out loud. We have Hemingway in this kind of archaic, stilted, weird dialogue. Great. In one of the most famous judgments in all of American literary criticism, Ernest Hemingway once claimed that all modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. It's surprising just how influential this claim has turned out to be, given that basic, basically nobody agrees with the other pronouncements Hemingway made about American literature. According to Hemingway, Poe's writing was dead, Melville's was too wrapped up in rhetoric. Emerson's was too British. And Thoreau's was just completely unreadable. All of this is on top of the fact that Hemingway didn't even bother to disparage anyone who is not a white man. <laughs> and yet, Hemingway's praise of Twain has endured, as have the terms he used to make it. Whatever objections we might make to Huckleberry Finn, and people do make objections to its racial politics, its prose is definitely not dead, pretentious, or the slightest bit unreadable. The question that I want to address in this talk is, 
What did Hemingway mean when he called Twain the origin of all modern American literature? Now, other literary critics who have addressed this question have said that Huckleberry Finn matters to American literature because of how utterly natural Huck's voice sounds. We get the illusion that we are hearing the spoken word. It sounds in our ear with the immediacy of the heard voice. It is a flexible colloquial language. It sounds just like a real boy talking out loud. So there's this kind of long-standing consensus among all these critics, even those with very different interpretations of the racial politics of the novel, that Huck's voice matters in American literature because it sounds just like a real boy talking out loud. But there's a problem with this account, and that is that Twain himself didn't actually think that you could ever get real life talk onto the page. So this is a letter of Twain's, um, but he says it in a bunch of different places. He says, spoken speech is one thing, written speech is quite another. Because the moment you put talk into print, you recognize that it is not what it was when you heard it. Which means that written speech was nothing but a dead carcass. Nothing but a pallid, stiff, and repulsive cadaver. Um, this would be a good Halloween talk. Uh, he said he was always painfully aware that naked talk and print conveys no meaning. So, on the one hand, we have Twain, who probably wouldn't have agreed that what makes Huckleberry Finn an important book is that it sounds just like a real boy talking out loud. And then on the other hand, we have to remember this is Hemingway we're talking about. Hemingway is probably not going to care one way or the other whether Huck sounds like a real boy talking out loud, because Hemingway is the person where his characters end up saying things like, Keep thy mouth off, what we must do when thy business is finished. So if we're trying to figure out this problem of why Twain mattered to Hemingway, which is by extension why Twain matters to the literary history of American literature, it has to be something other than how real his voice sounds. In fact, the basic argument of this talk will be that Twain's contribution to modern literature wasn't that he captured a natural sounding voice at all, but that he made the way that Huck's voice sounded completely irrelevant. To explain what I mean by this, I'll need to step back and take a broader look at the context in which Twain was writing. Huckleberry Finn was written at the height of Americans' obsession with dialect. So this is kind of what you were saying, Jenny, about like, it sounds like someone's speaking. Um, dialect, this moment of phonetically transcribed speech. All across America at this time period, writers were trying to capture their own version of the local accent in print. And just to give you a sense of how many different dialects there were out there, um, I'm going to throw some different examples from across the board up here, if you can see them. Um, they're hard to decipher. You don't have to try and figure out what they mean. I just want you to see how dense they are. So in 1848, we have James Russell Lowell, who gives us Yankee dialect. Uh, then we have Bret Hart on the Western frontier in 1868. Uh, Marion Miles Murphy gave us her Appalachian dialect in 1878. George Washington Cable gave us Louisiana Creole dialect in 1880. And then this is the notorious one, Joel Chandler Harris gave us plantation dialect with Uncle Remus in 1881. Um, so how many of you have seen like Song of the South or been on the, uh, the old um, Splash Mountain ride at Magic Kingdom? Yeah, Br'er Rabbit, those stories, that's Joel Chandler Harris. Yeah, so a, a little, hmm, a problematic fave, as the kids say these days. Um, I have more, like, the thing about Harris's dialect, it was both very, very popular at the time he wrote it, very controversial in our time. And I'm going to have more to say about it in just a moment. Um, but for now, like, the thing I want to emphasize is 
Huck Finn's written in 1886. It's published in 1886. It's written for like a decade before that. At the time when Twain is writing, if he wants to get published, not just in the newspapers, but in this prestigious literary magazines, he kind of has to figure out a way to do this. Even if he's really skeptical, skeptical about getting talking to print, this is the way to get published. So he has to figure out some kind of solution. In the end, the kind of language Twain came up with in Huckleberry Finn gave us the prose style that Hemingway would come to define as distinctly American. Not dead and pompous, not dense and hard to read, but instead fresh, natural, unaffected. How did Twain manage to do this? Twain's genius move was that he managed to incorporate a recognizable regional accent without falling into the trap of literally transcribing, like phoneme for phoneme, what had been said. By which I mean, <coughs> no one actually needs to have ever spoken like Huck for us to recognize his language as a version of our national language. He sounds American. What makes Twain so modern is he gave the country a voice that clearly belonged on the page rather than in anyone's mouth. Okay, so it's important to note here, I'm definitely not the first critic to suggest that Twain stylized Huck's voice. Uh, so this is a critic in the 1960s named Richard Brigman. He wrote this very influential book about the colloquial style in America, um, and he pointed out that Huck's voice was the first colloquial voice in American literature to escape what he called the quarantine of quotation marks. Um, according to Bridgman, uh, because Twain placed necessary limits on dialect, and by that he just means toning down some of those crazy misspellings, Huck's voice was able to surge over the quotation marks to flood the narrative itself. The thing is, Bridgman failed to recognize what it means that Huck's language is no longer trying to recreate the spoken word, but instead trying to appeal to readers on the basis of how it looks on the page. So Bridgman, in the end, continues to claim that one cannot insist too much on the verbal quality of Huckleberry Finn. It's the same thing that every critic of the book has always said. Uh, my argument is that when Huck's voice escapes the quotation marks and enters the narration of the novel, it stops being a speaking voice at all and starts being a purely literary language. It could only ever have existed on the pages of a novel. So, like I said, a lot of critics out there, um, I know like these literary fights might seem a little um, <laughs> obtuse, but like a lot of critics think exactly the opposite. And the most famous of them is someone named Shelley Fisher Fishkin. She wrote this book in 1993 called Was Huck Black? I'm seeing some nods, like some people have heard of it. Um, and Fishkin is making the case that what matters about Huck's voice is that it literally comes from a real boy, and a black boy at that. So Fishkin traces Huck's linguistic origins to the real conversation of a 10-year-old black child named Jimmy, a real person who really existed. And okay, so the reason Fishkin wants to make this argument is that she wants to prove that American literature in general owes this vast debt to the African-American creative tradition. Uh, and specifically in the case of Huckleberry Finn, that Huck's language was recycled from the real speech of an actual person of color. It's a way of proving that kind of heritage, that kind of debt. Um, so for Fishkin, Huck's natural sounding speech serves a really important representational purpose. It testifies to the kind of African American verbal artistry that has been systematically undervalued in American literature, which is a claim that requires Huck's voice to be absolutely true to life, to be like a real boy talk. So this might be a noble goal, but the problem with it, as we already know, is that Twain believed that speech stopped sounding anything remotely like real life the second it entered print. Instead of coming alive on the page, it turned into 
a corpse, a carcass, a cadaver. In contrast to Fisher, I want to argue that what Twain came up with in Huck's voice was a purely literary morality, which is to say, a prose style that studiously avoided transcribing the phonetic speech on which it was so obviously based. So to give an example, consider Huck's signature phrase, by and by. It's just like a reminder that keeps cropping up to tell us that it's still Huck there talking to us, just like he's carrying on a conversation with us. Um, but the thing about Huck's by and by is that it's really reminiscent of by and by from Joel Chandler Harris. So in Uncle Remus, which was published three years before Huckleberry Finn, by and by shows up 102 times. And in Huckleberry Finn, by and by shows up 85 times. Um, the best evidence, like I can't prove that Twain was inspired by Harris, but the best evidence for it is um, Twain really hated having to do his own research. It is not like a roll up your shirt sleeves and get down to business, come through, like go out and, and, and transcribe the way people are talking. That wasn't really his thing. Um, he also loved Uncle Remus. He once said that he read the stories out loud every night to his children until all of them, the kids and the adults, knew it by heart. He used to do impressions of Uncle Remus at the dinner party, at the dinner table when he was throwing parties. Um, so he's like, he's really familiar with it. Um, and he called Harris the only master of black dialect that the country has ever produced. So it's not hard to imagine that Twain would have borrowed some of Harris's characteristic dialect phrases and put them into Huck's mouth. The only reason no one has really noticed this before is because when Twain borrows Harris's dialect phrases, he stops spelling them at all the way they would have sounded out loud. He's no longer doing them in phonetic transcription. So by and by comes, becomes by and by. Powerful becomes powerful. Study and study becomes studying. Considerable becomes considerable. Dismember becomes disremember, so on and so forth. So you still get like the effect of the oral impression without the literally phonetic transcription. Um, the irony here in this setup is that most critics today think of these dialects as being very, very different creatures. So they tend to say like, oh, Harris's. Harris's dialect in Uncle Remus is a racist caricature. And Twain's dialect in Huckleberry Finn is a sympathetic, humanistic, authentic portrayal. Um, Shelley Fisher Fishkin, the critic I was just talking about, says these two dialects are worlds removed, that there is an enormous gulf between them. And, you know, like, there are reasons to doubt the idea that, like, Uncle Remus's dialect is phonetically genuine, which is what Harris claimed. Uh, for starters, Harris is very clear that he thinks people of color were better off as slaves. So he might not have been listening to black voices as carefully as he claimed to be. Um, but the point is that regardless of whether Harris's dialect is accurate or not, the fact that no one would even dream of calling Harris the father of all modern American literature should clue us into the idea that the accuracy of these accents isn't really the point. What makes Twain's version of printed speech matter is not that it sounds more like a real voice than Harris's does, which is some, what someone like Fishkin would claim. It's that Twain's version is no longer trying to sound like a real voice at all. If Huck used by the by with the spelling, uh, just like Uncle Remus, after all, the source of Huck's voice would still be speech. It would just be speech at one remove, filtered through Harris's transcription. But because Huck uses by and by instead, we get something entirely new, a dialect that is severed from the same speech it is purporting to recreate. Um, there's a slide I'm gonna skip because it gets like really dense and technical, um, but it has to do with standard English no longer being the frame 
Instead, in Huckleberry Finn, dialect is both inside the quotation marks and outside the quotation marks. Okay, so, all this is to say, when Twain did his very best to make Huck's language seem like something more than just a dead corpse on the page, he wound up creating, as if by accident, an entirely new representational space in the novel. Because Huck's language is so carefully cleaned up and simplified, because it's so clearly distinguished from both dialect misspellings and standard English, um, it no longer counts as transcribed speech at all, but instead becomes marked by its necessary relation to the page. Huck sounds so convincing to us because it's only within the novel that he's able to speak at all. His language is a purely literary orality, which is to say a version of oral inflected delivery that is obviously rooted in real speech and yet fundamentally cut off from its origins in speech. All right, now we're ready for the Hemingway part. Now, when we return to Hemingway's claim that Huckleberry Finn is the origin of all modern American literature, we can see exactly what Hemingway would have considered so modern about Twain. Namely, Twain took the natural sounding speech that was so popular in his era and transformed it into a very early version of the self-consciously literary language that would come to define Hemingway's era, the modern era, when we're thinking about the way language looks. This account of Twain's accomplishment does carry important implications for the racial politics of the, of the novel. It sounds like a technical distinction, but it has implications for us. Part of what makes Twain's novel modern is the way it takes a racial accent, the same kind of accent that testifies to the oppression of real life people of color, and turns it into a literary language that could be used to reimagine the country as an uncomplicated unified whole. The novel's racial politics, in other words, turn out to have less to do with how black and white voices speak to one another, Huck talking to Jim, Jim talking to Huck, and more to do with the way that a whitewashed voice comes to speak for all Americans. What drew Hemingway to the novel, of course, had less to do with the fact that Twain borrowed Huck's language from Uncle Remus, specifically, and more to do with the fact that Twain borrowed his language at all. For Hemingway, Twain's appeal was that Twain's technique, this ability to transform Huck's supposedly natural speech into a purely literary language, helped solve a significant formal problem, undergirding the transition from realism to modernism. As we have seen, even realist writers like Twain had already found it difficult to transcribe talk in a way that would seem at all believable. And modernist writers like Hemingway had started to find dialogue so unbearable to try to capture that they were like desperate, they were scrambling to try to find some means to escape like all oh, this like cheesy artificial thing that looks so fake on the page. Um, so Ben Lerner, this is, um, has anyone read Ben Lerner? He's like, he's made the rounds. He was a poet and then became a novelist and then became a literary critic and theorist. Um, he's like kind of a darling of English departments right now. <laughs> um, but he's helpful here. So Ben Lerner has called this the problem of dialogue, which he defines as how false and theatrical so much supposedly realistic dialogue feels because it doesn't represent the simultaneity or fragmentation of actual speech. In other words, whenever writers try to get their dialogue to look more realistic, so maybe they use like a lot of different line breaks to try and imply that two people are talking over each other, um, the effect is ironically just the opposite of their intention. Instead of being reminded of the noise and din and confusion of simultaneous conversation, um, the reader finds themselves looking at language that has very obviously been laid out to suit the purposes of the page. And so any version of printed speech, no matter how carefully transcribed, threatens to break the verisimilitude, the believability that is needed to hold the world of the novel together. What Lerner claims is 
it's not only that Hemingway came up with a solution to this problem, but that Hemingway's solution influenced his approach, and in fact, that of a whole bunch of other writers. Um, all these modernist writers who are trying to figure out how to write a novel still, Hemingway helped them do so. According to Lerner, this solution, the thing Hemingway came up with, was this idea of virtualizing speech. Um, so quick pause. Um, there's a song by Tenacious D. Uh, <laughs> the title of the song is, This is not the greatest song in the world. This is just a tribute. Virtualizing is kind of that idea. It's like, what I'm giving you is not the thing itself. It's just like an homage to the thing. Um, so, when Hemingway virtualizes his dialogue, he displaces actual speech somewhere off the page, where, you know, like, it's implied that someone spoke this, but we don't get what was actually spoken out loud. Um, so, there's this, like, kind of paradox that, in contrast to Twain, Hemingway's speech comes to seem believable uh, by seeming as unnatural as possible as opposed to Twain's, which seems as natural as possible. Um, when Hemingway makes his dialogue super, super unnatural, it's like essentially a declaration. This is not how the conversation could have ever sounded out loud. No one speaks like this. Uh, when Hemingway uses all these medieval terms, thee, thou, thy, the reader has to assume that this has been translated from a foreign language, in this case Spanish, and for whom the bell tolls. So Hemingway's medievalism, as Lerner calls it, guarantees that his dialogue can only ever be interpreted as a substitution for real speech, not a recreation of it. And here, I want to take Lerner's argument a step farther and claim that what gets virtualized in Hemingway's prose is not just the sound of the dialogue, but actually the meaning of the words that were originally spoken. So, I have a contrast between two Hemingway novels. In the earlier one, oh, hey, oh, I forgot about this slide. Uh, example of medievalism. I thank thee for them. Now you are going well and fast and far, and we both go indeed. Now put thy hand there. Now put thy hand there. You get the picture. So in the earlier novel, this is A Farewell to Arms in 1929. We have Frederick Henry, a soldier. And he tells us he is embarrassed by the words sacred, glorious, sacrifice, and the expression in vain. He finds these terms so embarrassing that he cannot bring himself to say anything at all. But then in 1940, when Hemingway writes For Whom the Bell Tolls, Hemingway's come up with this solution, this medievalism, to make translated dialogue, make otherwise empty rhetoric, mean something more like what it's supposed to mean. So Robert Jolder, another fighter, another soldier, uh, proclaims, for us will be the bridge in the battle. He admits that he felt a little theatrical, but it sounded well in Spanish. Jordan may believe that the cause he's fighting for, he may believe in the cause he's fighting for, no matter how trite it sounded. But it is only through phrases that sounded wonderful in Spanish that he manages to give voice to his convictions in a way that keeps his grandiosity from ringing hollow. The irony here, of course, is that it is precisely how wonderful all of these beautiful phrases sounded in Spanish that Hemingway refuses to give to us. Because if he gave it to us, it would deflate it, right? We wouldn't get the effect anymore. Lofty ideas about valor reach the reader only across the distance of implied translation. So when Jordan confesses, quite formally in Spanish, that I care about her very much. He's talking about Maria, the woman he's in love with. Uh, we never actually get to hear what that original Spanish sounded like, because that might make what he's saying sound too pretentious. 
when Hemingway virtualizes the language used to talk about romantic ideals, like courage or love, he manages to project a sense of earnestness that is at least partially sheltered from the disillusionment that such words usually evoke. And this special technique, it's like a superpower, it's kind of magic, of getting words to mean more like what you want them to mean is only made possible thanks to this technique of literary orality, which is the technique that Hemingway got from Twain. So Twain to Hemingway to Lerner to us today, all of this is made possible by this literary orality. Um, of course, when we frame Twain's contribution to American literature in terms of these like honestly kind of dry questions of literary technique, like words and whether they're inside or outside quotation marks and exactly how they're spelled on the page, it sounds like we're trying to like avoid these harder questions of racial representation. It sounds like the stakes are lower. Um, but I don't think they are. Like, that's why it's so interesting to see a writer like Ralph Ellison claim Hemingway as an influence. So Ellison, Ralph Ellison, Harlem Renaissance, real major figure, like he starts out thinking it's a problem that Hemingway extended Twain's technical influence on our fiction. He's saying, you know, like what mattered in Twain was the racial relationship between Jim and Huck. It's not the technique. Like there's something more there. Um, that's what Ellison says in 1946. And that's what most people remember him saying. Like there's something that matters there that's not just technique. But Ellison actually evolved. In the end, in 1964, he claimed Hemingway as his own true father as artist as the literary ancestor who made Ellison's entire generation of writers realize that whatever intervention it was possible for them to make in the world lay entirely in their possession of technique, which is to say their ability to create new possibilities of language, which would allow it to retain that flexibility and fidelity to the common speech, which has been its glory since Mark Twain. Ellison illustrates perfectly why Hemingway's debt to Twain matters to American literature. But as should be obvious by now, he can't help us understand the nature of that debt, since Ellison, like all the others, continues to think that what matters about Huck's language is its fidelity to the common speech. But once we see that what makes Huck's language matter is how utterly divorced it is from speech, then we have to reconsider the novel's racial politics. Twain was only able to liberate morality for use as a literary language by placing black speech in a white mouth. This is the very last page of the novel. Jim, the runaway slave, gets the last bit of spoken dialogue in the entire story. One of his last lines is, he ain't a coming back no more. He's talking about Huck's father. But it is Huck's ever so slightly cleaned up version of that dialect. When Huck says that books are too much trouble to make, and he ain't a going to no more, that makes the leap from dialogue into narration, and from there into the history of the novel. Twain was only able to overcome the artificiality of printed speech by creating a narrator capable of absorbing, mastering, and repurposing racialized expressions for his own ends. And all modern American literature, born of Twain, derives from this fantasy of a single narratorial voice capable of safely containing the racial other. What Hemingway saw in Twain mattered, both because it formed the basis of America's most characteristic prose style, and because it thematized the tension between, on the one hand, all the different ways that Americans actually spoke, and on the other, the way they might be imagined to speak with one voice, the voice of the people.